Let's pray. Oh, Father, God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, to shine in our hearts, we pray today that the light of the knowledge of the glory of you in the face of Jesus Christ will be seen as we follow your leading in the past and through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know that um, wonderful quote, we have nothing to fear except as we forget how the Lord has led us in our past and our history. We're going to take a little jaunt through history today. Feast in the dark. Well, uh, people have been in the dark for a long time, and light is beginning to show. It's shining again. And there's been darkness in various times through history. And... Uh, Let's turn to Exodus chapter 10. There was a dark time. And the children of Israel, just before they got out of Egypt, Exodus chapter 10, and let me tell you what verse it is here. Oh, starting around 21, 22. Let's start 21. Darkness was over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Have you ever felt darkness before? <laughs> you reached out to try to feel something <laughs> in the dark, and it was that dark, penetrable dark. It just kind of oozed in and um, obscured everything. A thick darkness... Verse 22, in all the land of Egypt, three days, it's a long time, be in total darkness, it's solitary confinement. <laughs> they couldn't, they saw not one another, neither rose up any from his place for three days, but... Verse 23, all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Children of, of uh, God are not in darkness. They have light. And down through the ages, God has preserved his light, even in the darkness. There was another time. Now, this darkness, you know, was a plague. It was the ninth plague just before the last plague, when the children, the last one that set them free, just before the deliverance. And there is often, it's darkest just before dawn, right? The last plague, Passover. Isaiah chapter 60 was a prophecy of another time of darkness. And you can read it there. If you turn to Isaiah 60, you'll notice that it begins with light. But this light comes out of darkness. It was a darkness that shall be over the... It shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. So just before deliverance in Egypt, out of Egypt, there was darkness for three days. You remember when Jesus was on the cross, there was darkness for the space of three hours. We're going to look at a much longer time period, a longer time span uh, called the Dark Ages, which lasted for three days and a half prophetic days, right? Did uh, any of you get up to see the eclipse of the moon? Yeah, five, five o'clock-ish, around there. 
I took a picture of it. it sort of came out. I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. But what's the moon? What does it mean when the moon goes dark? Where was the moon in prophecy? The woman standing on the moon and clothed with the sun. Now, when the moon, when she's, when the moon is dark, and what does that mean? What is that saying to us about the church? What happened to the church? They're in the dark about the moon, and there's something about that that uh, was obscured. The earth got in the way of the sun and darkened the moon. So when the earth, when worldliness darkens the church, it loses some important truth, light. Well, there's the picture, first picture I took. And the moon's, yeah, it's up there. Can't see it very, so I zoomed in. Yeah, it looks a little better. And I hope you can see the rosiness of it there, the red. Yeah, the camera helped bring that out better than my eye. It did have a, a reddish cover to it. We waited around through the darkest part. It never did, for that top cap kept staying white the whole time. But that was an eclipse of the moon by the earth. There's a lesson in that, isn't there? What happened in the early period of time after the church had been established for a while, there was uh, changes. There was, as Paul talked about, a falling of way. And Constantine, that Christian emperor, who convened a council in Nicaea, there in Turkey, just outside of town on the edges of Constantinople, city he named after himself, had two things on the agenda. One of them is famous for the Council of Nicaea, which is the Nicene Creed. But the second item on the agenda was this matter of Passover. You see, there was a growing distance. The church wanted to distance itself from the Jews, and they were keeping Passover on a certain time that was determined by the moon. And the church had uh, wanted to distance not only the moon aspects, but the Sabbath was a problem. That identified them with Jews, and Jews were always getting in trouble, and they didn't want to get in trouble, and so they wanted to go to a different day, the Sunday. And Easter became tied to the sun, and it was always going to be on a Sunday. So that was the second thing that was determined, ruled. That's the way all the church is going to keep Passover, which they called Easter now. They have a different name as well. Reminds you of Jeroboam. Uh, Jer Jeroboam. Uh, he split away from Judea, went up north. First thing he did, change the feast, change the date, new worship center. And the Dark Ages began, now, not officially yet, but it was, we were in darkness there, right? We, we can see that the darkness was beginning. What happens also, often when you have a lunar eclipse, the moon is darkened, either two weeks before or two weeks after, the moon comes around in position again, and there is a solar eclipse. They often go together. What happens when the moon gets in the way of the sun. Can't see the sun. Now the sun is darkened. What is that happening to us? We lose sight of Jesus. What happens when we lose sight of Jesus? And the church has gotten their focus and their eyes off the Son of God. These two things seem to co correspond and, and travel together down through history. And we're going to follow that uh, as we go along. The Dark Ages began, and we know in uh, Daniel 7, where we see this fourth dreadful beast, and it has ten horns, and among them comes up a little horn, and as it comes up, it uproots three horns. What were these three horns that were uprooted? Why were they uprooted? And what did the little horn have to do in uprooting them? The first one in history was the Heruli, also uh, 
known as the Lombards in northern Italy. And they were eliminated in 493. Now this is a, over 100 years, 150 years after the Council of Nicaea. But things had developed after that council. There was a polarization in the church. Those who didn't want to follow the churches that was in league and in power with Rome and its teachings, which were getting more and more out of Scripture and more and more into tradition. And so these three horns had something in common. We're going to follow this along. They all believed much the same thing. They rejected the beliefs of the Roman church. And this was a thorn in the little horn, a thorn in the little horn side. And uh, marshaled armies against them, the Carthaginians, also known as the Vandals in North Africa, were also Christians. Herioli were Christians, the Vandals were Christians. They were attacked and uh, disappeared from history in 533 with the siege of Carthage. The Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths, came from the Balkans, Serbia, Croatia, Bulgaria. In recent years, you remember we had some wars over there, Croatia, Croatia and the Croats and the Serbs, and they were fighting. It was really a religious war. You don't hear about that. You think it's uh, all, it's all political. The Eastern uh, Goths moved down and they came into northern Italy and for a time they were in control of Italy. They had their capital in Ravenna, north of Rome. And this, the Pope wasn't happy with this and he sent back to the Eastern Empire, to Constantinople. Justinian was the emperor then and he said, help! <laughs> Send somebody out here and get, get us freed up. We can't do anything with these people. They're, they're taking over. So he sent Belisarius, his general, just as Napoleon sent Berthier down there to free the Pope. Only that was a reverse situation with Berthier, wasn't it? He took the Pope. Well, uh, actually, it was very similar because the Pope in charge at that time had been, it was the uh, the other Roman Catholics that had been displaced. There, if you know anything about papal history, the popes were in and out, and sometimes you had two, sometimes three popes at the same time fighting for who's the real pope, and they had a pope. And so the, the, the ones that wanted to be in power, they'd gotten out because the Ostrogoths had put their man in power. They were complaining to Justinian. So he comes and he takes the Ostrogothic pope out. And 538. Well, that's an important date in prophetic history, isn't it? Beginning of the three and a half years. So now we're beginning this Dark Age period. Out of uh, that, because of the persecutions, uh, some had to flee, and one of them was a man who was given a name by the Goths, Ophelius. Uh, their name in, in the Gothic language was Wolfius, but um, we know him as Ophelius. He was a Christian. He had been uh, ordained by uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia, who had been on the other side of the Nicene controversy, and they wanted to stick with the Bible, and these other folk had I some ideas. They were different. And so Ophelius took the Bible to the Goths. They didn't have a Bible. They had nothing printed, so he translated it. He had to create an alphabet. They didn't know how to read. He created an alphabet for them, the Gothic, uh, the Punic uh, alphabet, and wrote the Bible out for them, made the first translation in the Gothic language. There is a copy of that in the museum, the Carolina Museum in Sweden, Uppsala, Sweden, and uh, still on display there in purple velvet. It's a beautiful work. So a lot of things happened. These became Christian nations, but they were attacked. And uh, evidence of what they believed, this is uh, out of a journal that I found in Acad Acomedia. 
It's uh, got a mosaic, which I'm going to show you behind there. Uh, this is Gothic, and it's in a cathedral in Ravenna. This was their capital of the Gothic, the Ostrogoths. And the uh, cathedral is called the Apollinaire uh, Nere Nuovo. And on the wall in this uh, cathedral is what depicts, you think it was the Last Supper, but it's not exactly the Passover meal. And they uh, commented in this that this was a... Uh, festal supper generally held on the eve of Sabbaths or holy days. And uh, this was a Jewish custom, but these were Christians, and they're following much the same uh, teachings. You notice that there's fish in the plate there, not lamb. This is 24 hours before Passover, so it's held on the eve, the, just as we did the other day, yesterday. We had uh, an agape meal. They talk about the agape meal here. Did we not mention? Oh, I'm going to say that later on. <laughs> but they had, uh, and then after the sun went down, then the Passover meal. But this is the evening before. We see evidence of the Passover being held during the third, uh, fourth century, in the 300s. And uh, another work by Eusebius uh, on Passover. After the Pasek, we celebrated the Pentecost for seven complete weeks. And most of the time, evidence from hi early history like this is really hard to find, but we can find a few evidences, talk about Passover, and often Pentecost connected. Now, Epiphanius was not uh, a supporter of this. He's a, he's a critic. He's writing a book against the heretics, but it's the same time period. And he said, they use not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament. That was a critic. That was a criticism. Have you ever heard of New Testament Christians? A lot of people... The Old Testament, it's just like uh, the Mosaic Laws. The Old Testament's done away with, right? They think that's <laughs> nailed to the cross as well. So this is exceptional for them. They say, hey, there are some Christians that believe in the Old Testament. That made them unusual and distinctive as the Jews do. They have no different ideas from the Jews, but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it in the Jewish fashion, except for their belief in Messiah. For they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things. The divine creation. They're talking about the Messiah. Is the divine Messiah. Because also at the same time, there was... Other groups that had believed, and they, they said they were Christians, but they didn't believe that Jesus was divine. He was just a man. And he was adopted by God and taken to heaven and given God's ship, but he was not originally God. So that, that, this was unusual. This is a different group. The divine creation of all things and declare that God is one, and that his son, Yahshua, is the Messiah. They are trained in a nicety in Hebrew, for among them the entire law, the prophets and the writings, are read in Hebrew, as they surely are by the Jews. They are different from the Jews and different from Christians, only in the following. They disagree with the Jews because they have come to faith in Messiah. But since they are still fettered by the law, you hear that today? Yeah. You're in bondage to the law. <laughs> That's what, it's nothing new under the sun, is there? This was happening way back there, 300s. They're in fettered by the law, circumcision, the Sabbath, and the rest. What's the rest? The yeah, all the rest, and the rest of the Sabbaths, the weekly Sabbath and the rest of the Sabbaths, perhaps, too. They are not in accord with Christians. I might say in with Roman Christians. He, this Epiphanius was writing from Rome. They um, have the good news, according to Matthew, in its entirety in Hebrew. You knew he, Matthew was originally written in, in Hebrew, in Aramaic and Hebrew. For it is clear that they still preserve this in the Hebrew alphabet as it was originally written. Another book, this is uh, Joseph Brigham, 
uh, book was actually pub published uh, posthumously, I guess, at least this version of it was, 1852, The Antiquities of the Christian Church. He wrote, the ancient Christians were very careful in the ob observation of Saturday or the seventh day. It is plain that all the Oriental churches, did you catch that? All the Eastern churches, those are the Oriental churches, and the greatest part of the world, what? The greatest part of the world observed the Sabbath festivals. Anath Anath Athanasius likewise tells us that they are held religious assemblies on the Sabbath. Not because they were infected with Judaism, but to worship Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, that's just scripture. Mark 2.28, right? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, this is, Jesus said that. And Athanasius says the same. Well, who was Athanasius? He was one of the characters that was leading out in opposition there at the Council of Nicaea. Speaking of Athanasius, he wrote a book as well on the festivals. And in his letter number one, he stated, From this sacred day, he's talking about first fruits, we count one by one seven more weeks and celebrate the day of Pentecost. When we depart hence, what departure is he talking about? When we depart hence from this world, <laughs> we shall celebrate the full festival with the Messiah. So there was an anticipation of a future Passover and uh, all the festivals with Messiah in the new world, in the new, yeah, new Canaan. Another character, Didymus of Alexandria, writing in 387, this is late 4th century, after this solemnity, he's talking about the Passover, we shall also celebrate the Feast of Weeks called Pentecost, on which we shall reap as perfect sheaves and full of sears that which flowered in the spring. So there's a harvest there at Pentecost. But there is a greater harvest at the end, at the end of the summer, with the tabernacles we will have the greatest harvest. John Chrysostom of Constantinople, 387 or so, complained, he's one of the Roman Christians, complained of Christians keeping Jewish celebrations. It just can't get them to stop doing it, even though they've made the rule, a canon there at Nicaea back in 325. Here we have, what is that? 62 years later, they're still doing it. Ambrose of Milan, a couple years later, he wrote, Ambrose, now this is Milan, Italy, north, north of uh, Rome. In the spring we have the Pasca, uh, Pasca, when I am saved, when we celebrate the glory of the resurrection after the manner of the age to come. So they were keeping it there as well. From Constantinople, and th this was in what is today... Turkey and Istanbul. This is where all the seven churches were, from Ephesus to Laodicea, kind of an arc through Turkey. And this belief, all of this practice of keeping these festivals and the Sabbaths spread east and west. When they went east into Armenia, right from on the border there of Turkey, is Mount Ararat. And uh, surrounding that area is what is, was the uh, kingdom of Armenia. It had its own, it was, it had their own emperor through the Middle Ages. And uh, this is where the Armenian Christians later became call, uh, known as the Polisians. Uh, existed for over 200 years. A book, uh, this was written by Arn, A-R-N-E, I can't remember his first name now, but he had a whole chapter on the Polisians. And he says that Edward Gibbons also devotes a whole, whole chapter to their history. And they had been most egregiously libeled of all the Christian sects. What does that mean? All kinds of untruths were said about these people. Have you ever experienced having somebody say something about you that 
No, wait a minute. I didn't say that. I don't believe that. I'd w <laughs> that was happening to them. And this was the common practice. You, you, if you've got somebody you disagree with, you call them a heretic. And you give them a name. And they called them a lot of bad names. Well, the uh, Taurus Mountains, which separated, there's where Mount Ararat was, into Armenia. Lived there in the 8th and 9th centuries. This communi uh, community of Christians cherished their own discipline, rites, and doctrines apart from the main body of the Eastern churches and all its later developments. These people who came to be known in the outside world as Polisians and who afterwards accepted the title for themselves. They didn't originally call themselves that. But other people gave them that name. Owe their original separateness to their geographical seclusion. And uh, therefore it's quite arguable that they should be regarded as representing the survival of a more primitive type of Christianity rather than as the followers of a heresy which sprang up near the time when they emerged from the daylight of history. Now he mentions Conabare. Frederick or Fred C. Conabare discovered while he was over there a book in one of their churches and he made a copy of it. Apparently he knew how to read Armenian and he translated the book and I, I got a you can Google Books is a wonderful resource. They have scanned all kinds of ancient documents. I, it's amazing. And I found what he, uh, they refer to here, the Key of Truth, this book that he found. And he, apparently he could, um, the form of the Ar Armenian was ancient Armenian. It's like picking up a King James Bible. You know, you, hey, this is old stuff. We don't talk this way anymore. And he, did, he felt that it was probably around the 800 A.D. vintage. And uh, he made a book of it. Here's the copy off of Google Books, The Key of Truth, Manual of the Polistian Church of Armenia. And uh, he translated it. And the Armenian text is in there. So he's got all of it, and then they've got the English translation. Here's what he had to say in his findings of this that these people resembled the iconoclastic emperors. They, they, didn't agree, they didn't agree with the practice of worshiping or honoring or adoring these pictures, these icons of the saints. And um, some of them have even influenced these emperors. There was the iconoclastic wars, if you know anything about in history, and they'd go into churches and they'd take all the icons <laughs> out. Um, they were called Oriental Baptists or Eastern Baptists because they didn't believe in infant baptism. And uh, they were, he says, in many respects, they were Protestants before Protestantism. Early, early on. Orthodox, they had an unorthodox view of the nature of Christ. Well, unorthodox. What's orthodoxy? Orthodoxy for some is unorthodoxy for someone else. And what is unorthodoxy for that people is orthodoxy for them. So uh, what they understood was an, uh, different than what people from Nicaea were teaching. That's what they're referring to. And uh, yeah, about the year 800, a simple church order, no hierarchy. Uh, infant baptism, we mentioned, reputed. In fact, they believed you had to be 30 years of age before you got baptized because that's what Jesus was. And it should be in a river. And um, they had very few sacraments, <laughs> it says. And they were, um, it was baptism by immersion, okay. And that they're, they say Eucharist, the Passover. And we'll see later on, he uses the word Easter, but it's Passover, is what they were uh, observing was taken at night with an agape meal. Just like we did, Just like we did right? Mariolatry, what's that? They didn't worship Mary or the saints. Uh, image worship, use of crosses, relics, incense, candles, uh, all repudiated. They didn't believe in purgatory. There's Easter. They say Easter is kept on the 14th of Nisan. Easter is not on the 14th of Nisan. Uh, this is Passover they're referring to. But they use the term Easter because that's conibear, uh he, that was a more familiar term for him. No special Sunday observances. Possibly Saturday Sabbath was maintained. And they had no feast of Christmas or the Annunciation or all the other Roman Catholic festivals. 
Interesting, the word Trinity never appears in the book, Keys of Truth. That's another statement that I've heard made about uh, someone else that wrote a lot of books. Ellen White never used the word Trinity or triune or co-eternal or any of those uh, Nicene terms. So out of Armenia on the east, the same thing was happening on the western part of Turkey. It, it spread in both directions. And over here in Bulgaria, about uh, as the uh, Polisians were, they became terribly persecuted. And many of them were uh, transported off uh, to other countries, hoping to get rid of them. But over on the other side, it used to be called Thrace, uh, now, down, now day Bulgaria, and from there spread into other uh, regions, Serbia, Romania, which we will be visiting later this month. I'll try to find out some more. I'm going to go do some archaeology <laughs> and see if I can find more evidence of the spread of these uh, beliefs there. And uh, the Bogomils. Boga is a Slavic victor, God. Bog. Mil is love. So these were God lovers or loved of God. And uh, that was the name that they went by. This is about 1,000. The middle now, we're in the mid mid section of the Dark Ages. And this, you recognize Andrews University. I published a paper, a dissertation by Doisian Zividinovich, uh, Sabbath in the Eastern Church, said that uh, the Bogomils also stressed on the law of Moses, with the exception of the sacrifices, and accordingly, they practiced circumcision, abstained from the unclean meats, they observed the Sabbath as a day of rest, they disbelieved in Trinity, but accepted Christ as divine. I find that an interesting statement because it sounds like they think maybe this is a contradiction. And that's often the prevailing uh, understanding that if you don't believe in the Trinity and you don't believe that Christ is divine, you have to believe in the Trinity in order to make Christ divine. That's a false statement. But uh, we'll find that this, this follows together throughout history. Members of the movement at Milan, now this is from Blunt's Dictionary of Sex and Heresies, Another group called the Paterines, which is named after a, a part of the city there in Milan called Pateria, said they observed the law of Moses, except as to sacrifices, circumcision, the Sabbath, the distinction of clean and unclean foods, and appealed to the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. <laughs> a, they're saying, many of these sources are saying the same thing about the same peoples in different times and different places, but you can see it's the common spread of this truth throughout the Dark Ages. Here's a map that shows the progression of the Paulicians there through Turkey, uh, across uh, the Bosporus at Constantinople into uh, Bulgaria. They were known, known as the Bogomils. Up into Bosnia, Croatia, up into northern Italy. There's Milan, there's where Ambrose was. Remember Ambrose? <laughs> and uh, the Valdins, up in the mountains, the uh, Alps between France and Italy, and Switzerland's in there. Albi, you see Albi there to the left of uh, Valdins. That's where the Albigenses were, southern France. Lyon in France, it was the poor men of Lyon that uh, had to flee from there up into the mountains and became known as the Valdenses, the Valdenses. But they were just one group of many. We often hear of the Waldenses, we talk about the Waldenses, but there were many other groups. Went all through Europe, even up into London to the uh, British Isles. Down into Spain as the Cathars, these were also known as the Visigoths, there's where the Western Goths were. And um, lots of persecution that they faced. Actually, the result of their beliefs is what led to the Spanish Inquisition, as we'll see in a moment. 
So during the 12th century, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Paliceans, the Cathars, the Bogomils, the Passagenians, Passagenians, that's an interesting name, they lived in the passes between the mountain. They were the valleys in between them, the passes of the Alps. Uh, Paterines rejected the Catholic feasts and fasts. And here's another uh, work called The Walden Seas, sketches the evangelical Christians in the valleys of the Piedmont, 1853. The Waldensian Synod anciently met every year in the month of September, the seventh month. They were meeting then. This is John T. Christian, History of the Baptists. And they trace their origins back through the Anabaptists, but they continue to go back as well. The Anabaptists continued observing many of the same external points as the Waldenses, such as they viewed the Old Testament of great importance, retained the Waldensian translation of the Bible, which had the epistle of Paul to the Laodiceans. We don't have that letter of Paul, and that'd be interesting to read. <laughs> try to find a copy of that. Continued to worship using the same forms of prayers and hymns, the same observations of the Passover once a year, the same view toward congregation buildings, free from idols and crosses, simple praying dress, all showing that the 16th century Anabaptists descended from the Walden Seas. So now, remember, we saw that England, London, they, they actually got up into uh, Britain, this is in Oxford, England. A group called the Publicani were condemned for rejecting Catholic practices and keeping the law with all its ordinances. Here's the Passaginians again. This is from Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. A denomination which arose in the 12th century called the Circumcised. They seem to have been a remnant of the Nazarenes and have distinguishing tenets. One that the observation of the law of Moses in everything except the offering of sacrifices was obligatory upon Christians. First, they teach... Oh, this is um, Bonacursus. He is uh, writing from Rome. He's uh, one of the Roman Catholics. Uh, against... There's, there was Roman Catholics. There's Greek Catholics. There was, uh, we found a place that uh, talked about the... Uh, Apostolic Catholics, <laughs> which is in England, against the heretics they called the Passagi. And first, they teach that we should obey the law of Moses according to the letter, the Sabbath, circumcision, and the legal precepts still being in force. They also teach that Christ, the Son of God, is not equal with God. Now, that's a, remember, this is someone who's writing critical of them. And this is often the way it's described, isn't it? We were accused as, Adv as Adventists in early Adventism in the 1800s that we didn't believe that Christ was divine, that we didn't believe in uh, that he was uh, a lesser God, an inferior God. You'll hear those terms used. Jesus said... <laughs> But when Paul says, uh, being in the form of God, he was not ashamed to be, or did not feel it robbery to be equal with God. That's one way to be equal with God, is to have the form of God. And as Jesus came out of his Father, he had to, by inheritance. He inherited everything that his Father had. And that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, these three persons are not one God and one being. Well, that's what those at Nicaea drifted off to tradition, maintained their belief, and so anyone who differed in that was uh, he, he had to write a book against them. Uh, Passaginians in 1250, this is uh, Gregorius of Bergamo, the sect of the Passagini, uh, Passagini teach that the Old Testament festivals are to be observed, circumcision, distinction of foods, and in nearly all other matters save the sacrifices, the Old Testament is to be observed as generally as the new. That's the same thing. They're all saying the same thing uh, about different people. Here we are in Spain. Valencia is the center of the Spanish Inquisition. This book, written in 1937, describes the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians with Judaizing tendencies. I don't know why they include the Muslims in there, but they didn't uh, believe in the eating of pork. 
So I probably grouped them together. Um, celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, and they fasted on atonement. That's very rare to find any reference to some of the other feasts. You hear uh, Passover and Pentecost, but there's one on atonement as well. They were keeping all of them, actually. They observed the Sabbath from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. They kept the food laws, rejected the Catholic doctrines, and denied the Trinity. We're getting now near the end of the Dark Ages. Sabbatarians of Transylvania were moved back. Now we're back into Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, that area. Andreas Ossi uh, compiled the old hymn book of the Sabbatarians with 110 compositions, 44 related to the Sabbath, 5 belonging to the new moon, 11 to the festival of Passover, 6 to the Feast of Weeks, 6 to Tabernacles, and 1 to the Day of Atonement. You have any of those hymns in our songbook? Wouldn't that be interesting to see? That? I've got one of them here I'm going to read to you. This was written by Samuel Kohn. He was a Jew, Kohn, uh, priest. Uh, is the word in Hebrew, Cohen, and uh, his book, The Sabbatarians. And so I went looking for it on Google Books, and I found it. It was in Hungarian. But Google Translate, all you have to do is, uh, and this was uh, in Budapest, 1889. Okay, there it is. So I typed in, I, I couldn't do all the little accents and stuff, but you type in the letters into Google Translate, and it comes back. There's, I, I found the page where his name is. You all see? And this phrase right there is um, an old songbook. So the old Sabbatarian songbook, uh, Sombatos, that's uh, Sabbath. The old Sabbatarian songbook, like all the other Sabbatarian literature, unpublished, lying to a variety of books and manuscripts in, but it was more luck than this literature, more products. The Times, oh dear, I can't know that road, training of human hands, which lit the bonfire, Sabbatarian four books, rather spared. Oh, this was not working. I mean, it's okay, it kind of gives you a little idea what they're saying, but uh, it wasn't perfect translation. So, but I knew I was on the right track, and I kept looking, and I found another copy. This is in English. Uh, the Sabbatarians in Transylvania. There it is by Samuel Cohen. They keep the Sabbaths and holy days in the feasts, as well as all the other original doctrines of the apostles. They celebrate the Passover of Israel according to the command of our Christ. This is, this is a Jewish author. And he goes through there, and he says... These are Jews. He thinks he wants to identify them as Jews, but then he says, no, they believe in Christ. Jesus is the Son of God and being divine. And uh, They couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and I found another copy. This one was in German, but it, uh, they had an English translation. And this is one of the hymns out of the hymnal. All pageantry. Now, I'm sure it probably rhymed or... It sounded different in their language. All pageantry not from the Bible word most certainly arrives from Italy. <laughs> of this truth we bear witness. Hearts be stirred. As far as Rome itself, the Pope city, just ask the Pope. He shall himself confess. His celebrations do not come from God. The Jewish statutes God alone will bless. <laughs> well, that one rhymed. <laughs> Where Pope's unholy refuse to trod, he may claim that the Bible is divine, but his grand liturgies are, liturgies are not found there. He does not say they are not Rome's design. That one rhymed too. Invented for the God-man's idle prayer, however held, pass over in God's word, we, as we can clearly read what God commands. Pope Victor changed, the Jewish rites interred, write, wrote innovations with holy hands. Instead of Sabbath, they Sunday hold, the Passover into Easter transform, Whitsuntide, that's one of their, yeah, they boldly make the celebration of the 50th day. And so this one, oh, there's another one in, in English uh, uh, describing the same book, and they talk about um, this man, the first man there was a Francis, uh, they got two, two first names, Francis David. And he came in teaching the complete master of the Old and New Testament. He knew uh, Hebrew, and they said, oh, he must be, a, must be a Jew. And there it talks about the hymns. There's, you can see all the hymns down there from the different uh, things. Uh, then on page 478, 
They held their first synod in Udvareli. At one of these gatherings, the calendar was so adapted as to secure the simultaneous celebration of the new moon and festivals. Sabbatarians viewed themselves as converted Gentiles, and they held to the biblical holidays. Another publication, Andrews University Press, leaked the Sabbatarianisms in the 16th century. So, uh, oh yeah, and this now comes to uh, back to London, New London. I, oh, we're in America now, but we're still in the Dark Ages. 1798 hadn't come. It's this is in uh, 1684. First recorded general meeting of Sabbath keepers in America. And in Martha's Vineyard. So we talked about the eclipses, but you know after an eclipse, what happens? Moon. moon comes out. Sun shines again. Restoration. The Reformation will restore the truth. And it did to a great degree. But then that was just the, the sun. We got to get the sun out. They provide light, light, and then there's more light when the eclipse, the moon eclipse, is, uh, goes away. More truth is restored to the to the church, and we have, it's, we people call it new truth. It's really old truth, isn't it? Yeah. And it's been sustained and protected by believers all down through those dark ages. Light in the darkness. I hope that gives you great courage. That. Uh, these are not just idle fables, beliefs, but God's truth. Let's, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, your protecting hand. We're honored to know you and know about you and your Son and your indwelling Spirit. And we ask that all of us be united through that today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.